modern aircraft, droning casually from point to point at three times the speed of a typhoon, is shrinking the earth. Heedless of the natural barriers, ocean and mountain range, contemptuous of the unnatural barriers, dotted lines on maps and barbed wire frontiers. Peoples who a quarter of a century ago lived half a world apart are now next door neighbors. Kuala Lumpur, say, in Malaya, is four weeks distant from Melbourne, Australia by sea. By air, it's a mere 16 hours. And when Rajis leaves Kuala Lumpur for Melbourne, she begins a journey that doesn't end in 16 hours' time. The end of her journey is in the future. When Wendy says goodbye to her family and friends at the little country station of Lang Lang in Gippsland, she too is setting out on a journey that will carry her far beyond the terminus at Flinders Street Station. Wendy's train journey is only 50 miles. It takes about an hour and 40 minutes. But for her too, it's only the beginning of a far longer journey that will end no one can say where. Because, like Rajis from Kuala Lumpur, her destination is the University of Melbourne. At a university, the thinkers and scientists, the doctors and men of law, the engineers and the dreamers of tomorrow acquire the knowledge, the skills and the humanities on which the future will be built. So a university is a pretty important institution. And so far as Australia is concerned, the universities were never more important because today they are receiving students from many Asian countries. It's appropriate that the aeroplane, which has jolted Australia into an awareness of the proximity of her Asian neighbours, should also make it practicable for young Asia to share Australia's educational facilities. But the presence of young Asians at our universities means much more than the acquisition of knowledge and skills because the peace and prosperity of the Southeast Asian countries and Australia depend on mutual understanding and common aims. And so the free association of the future leaders in so many spheres in their own countries has a value far beyond mere speculation. free association, at work, at play, in social life. But is it being achieved? Rajis is one of those thousands of Asian students. During her first moments in Melbourne, she feels lost, bewildered. The whole atmosphere is so very different from home. The way people dress, the way they talk, even the way they move, all are new and strange. She realizes, of course, that this is inevitable, that it will take some time to adjust herself to her new scene. Although she doesn't know what to expect when she arrives at the university, she does know how she would like it to be. She sees a house, an international house, where Australian students and students from Asia live in close contact with each other where there's a friendly welcome that, from the start, dispels that sense of strangeness, because here the older students have already broken down the insidious barriers of race. They are individuals, individuals who matter in themselves, no longer just Australians or Malays or Chinese or Indians or Indonesians. They are people. In this international house, each student will have a room of his or her own, a room to escape to at the end of the day, to the seclusion of private thoughts, a room to study in, to relax in, a room to contain personal treasures and tokens, a room that is a reasonable substitute for home. This international house would have, too, its own library and comfortable common rooms for quiet conversation or for those social occasions which could bring overseas students into close touch not only with Australian fellow students but also with Australians from outside the university. 
there would be a big refectory and kitchens where occasionally students could cook their own national dishes. And of course there would be rooms for sport and recreation. Such an international house would be a wonderful thing for Rajas, shy, bewildered, more than a little lonely. For passengers who have just arrived by flight number 403 from Sydney, Darwin and overseas, please board the Airways bus now standing outside the passenger lounge. But Raji's dream has no reality. Instead of that desirable international house, there may be only a boarding house available. There are landladies and mean landladies, and Raji's could be unlucky. Fortunately, plans for an international house in Melbourne are already underway. In 1950, a group of undergraduates who realized the need for such an institution raised 2,000 pounds with a carnival. That was the start. A committee was set up, presided over by Dr. Ian Clooney's Ross, CBE. Sir John Medley, a former vice chancellor of the university, was chairman of the appeals committee. Support came from many quarters, and within three years, some 35,000 pounds had been raised. On the strength of this support, plans were prepared for the first international house in Australia. This fine building will cost over a quarter of a million pounds. It will accommodate 126 students, at least half of whom will be from abroad. Although it can't accommodate all overseas students, its spacious public and dining rooms will at least make it a social centre for them. International House will be built in stages on a site in Sydney Road, only a few minutes' walk from the university. The University Council has approved plans for the first stage to cost £150,000. The University of Melbourne hopes that individual Victorian towns will raise the money for students' rooms, each room to be named after the town that made it possible. Within the walls of International House, understanding and cooperation between Southeast Asia and the Commonwealth will be realised far more effectively than over conference tables. For here, not impersonal political relationships, but abiding personal friendships will be achieved.